Okay, picking up where we left off. We ended last class with a comparison of two uh, uh, sometimes related reactions, sigma bond metathesis and 1-1 um, migratory insertion as it, as it pertains to carbene insertion. And there was a question that arose after class that I'll just spend one minute to, to comment on, and that will actually be directly germane to uh, today's class. And so if you scroll all the way up, sorry if this is pretty dizzy, one of the points that I made in terms of migratory insertion is that there's no change in oxidation state. And that is true in carbonyl migratory insertion, but in the case, and so I've added this qualifier um, here. In the case of uh, carbene migratory insertion uh, that we saw manifest itself in these uh, tantalum examples, this is not strictly true. And the reason is because the carbon metal multiple bonded species that we make can exist in two flavors, either a so-called Schrock type carbene or a Fischer type carbene. And how we count electrons and assign oxidation state in these species is dependent on a number of factors that we'll talk about today, the metal, its oxidation state, and the nature of the carbogenic substituent. Uh, so with, with CO, this is always uh, redox neutral, no change in, in oxidation state. With uh, carbene insertion, uh, we need to uh, understand the context in which, in which the event is happening. Are there any questions on last time's class? Okay, so moving right along then, we'll discuss now 1-2 migratory insertion, the close cousin of 1-1 migratory insertion. So you'll see here some similarities, but also some very important differences. The overall depiction of this elementary process is shown here. A shared feature with 1-1 migratory insertion is that upon migration of the carbogenic substituent, we've opened up a coordination site that we then need to uh, trap with a uh, coordinating ligand in order to provide thermodynamic driving force for this process. When the migrating group R here is a hydride, this process can be referred to as hydrometallation. And when it's a carbogenic group, it can be referred to as carbometallation. And these terms you're probably familiar with. And so if you hear these used interchangeably, one, two migratory insertion, hydrometallation, they are indeed um, the, the same process. Or more precisely, hydrometallation is a subclass of one, two migratory insertion. So let's walk ourselves through this, um, this process now. So if a metal, in the case of the hydride. So in the, in the, uh, as the metal hydride approaches the alkene, it will first form this encounter complex that we talked about. And then in the forward direction, uh, we'll form a new carbon hydrogen bond uh, at, and a new uh, carbon metal bond. And there is a intermediate that is thus generated, um, which is a, referred to as a, a gastic intermediate. I'll elaborate, that, elaborate on that in just a moment. And this is a three center two electron species. Again, we see these interactions uh, quite often in organometallic chemistry. So then continuing in the forward direction, now we have trapping with the ligand uh, to provide uh, thermodynamic driving force for this process that in principle is reversible. So then if we go in the reverse direction, we see that uh, when we lose a ligand and have an open coordination site and there is a CH bond at the position beta with respect to the methyl alpha beta. Now uh, we can form this agostic interaction, this agostic intermediate, and then it can proceed through uh, beta hydride elimination uh, to generate the metal hydride and the alkene. The process is uh, syn stereospecific. With, uh, in, in most cases, there, there are some exceptions uh, when uh, we're talking about uh, radical-based processes, uh, but in, in general, the traditional 1-2 migratory insertion as defined here is, is syn-stereospecific. 
so some of the differences, key differences in, uh, in, in one two migratory insertion versus one one migratory insertion uh, come when we consider the migratory aptitude of the different groups involved here. So as a review from a previous lecture, we saw that in CO one one migratory insertion, uh, metal hydrides essentially do not participate in this, this process because that, that elementary event is thermodynamically quite uh, far uphill. And then uh, feral groups are, are, the, the, are, are the next most likely to participate. And then, and then alkyl groups are the, most, uh, are the most reactive. And the bulkier they are, the more reactive they are. Now we see at least first approximation, the opposite trend in one two migratory insertion. So here, metal hydrides, uh, uh, hydrogen atoms are the, or hydride ligands are the fastest to undergo migratory insertion uh, because they're the smallest. And uh, there's, in the transition state for one, two migratory insertion, uh, steric clashing plays a dominant role in, in dictating activation uh, energy. And you can, you can get a sense for that when you look at this transition state structure, how, how it's a, um, uh, a, a closely packed, uh, uh, four center transition state. So H atoms are, are most reactive, then aryl groups, and then uh, alkyl groups. Um, we said that um, an important factor in reductive elimination is considering the S character of the migrating orbital, and the same is true here. So orbitals that have higher S character, alkenal, or alkynal, alkenal, aryl, migrate faster than, than alkyl states, because again, the trend here is sterically dominated. I'll comment briefly on regioselectivity trends in the specific case of uh, terminal alkenes and, and metal hydrides. Some of these trends you will already be quite familiar with, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll comment um, on it and try to provide clarification for those who haven't seen this before. So let's consider three different flavors of terminal alkene here. So the first we'll consider where R equals an aryl substituent. So these are styrenal substrates. And here hydrometallation will take place uh, in a branch selective fashion or where we put the metal at the benzylic position. And the reason for that is because uh, when the metal is in the benzylic position, it can be stabilized through this haptotropic stabilization that we talked about. It can exist as the eta-1 species drawn here or as the eta-3 species. So that's a stabilizing interaction. A point that is also important but sometimes not emphasized is that when we do a hydrometallation event, we need to consider the stability of the metal carbon bond that we make, but also the new carbon H bond that we make. And note here that when we have this so-called Markovnikov selective hydrometallation or branch selective hydrometallation, we form a new CH bond that is non-benzylic. If you consider the opposite process, you would, you would form a weaker benzylic CH bond. So you have two factors here, both where the metal sits and where the H atom sits that both argue in the same direction. That is what controls Markovnikov selectivity in this hydrometallation process. Okay, let's now shift to a second flavor of alkenes. These are conjugated alkenes where R is some resonance electron withdrawing group. So think here enones, acrylates, acrylonitriles, et cetera. Um, like in the case of styrenes, we, uh, we have a, a, a branch selective or Markovnikov selective process. And here, I think the, 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 there are a couple factors to consider. One is the polarization, the ground state polarization of the alkene, which has strong delta plus character at the beta position with respect to the electron withdrawing group. We're all familiar with that from, from conjugate addition, one four type addition reactions. And then similarly, when you form a metal enolate species, I've drawn it here as the C bound enolate, but metal enolates can, can exhibit a, a, sh a shifting process that, that, that is analogous, though not, not exactly the same as the heptotropic shift that we see haptotropic stabilization that we see in benzylic species. Metal enolates can exist as the C-bound form 
here or the, or the O-bound form. And so that's another um, um, process by which the branch position can be, can be stabilized here. Let me, let me draw that out just in case that's, that, that's un unclear. I'll draw it in the specific case of, a, of, an, of an enone just for clarity. This is C bound enolate. I think this, this should feel familiar from classical, what you learn about classical carbonyl chemistry in, in intro organic. And in some cases, these are con configurationally stable as the C enolate. You don't populate the O bound state, but uh, this is at least in principle possible. Now, the third flavor of alkene we'll consider is the simple R equals alkyl, non-conjugated, unactivated, unstrained alkene. So alpha olefin feedstocks, think here like one octane or one dodecene. Now, in this case, often hydrometallation will take place with the opposite reducible activity to what we considered before. So now the H atom is at the internal position. The metal is, at, is oriented at the terminal position. And the dominant factor here is that remember metals are large. So if given the choice to be at a secondary position or a primary position, it would prefer to be at a primary position or that would be at low, lower energy. And so the thermodynamically preferred process is to end up at a, at a terminal point of an alkane. And so we'll, we'll cover in just a moment, a process called chain walking where alkyl metal species can isomerize um, up and down an alkyl chain and the thermodynamically preferred endpoint is to get to a, a, a terminal position in the absence of some of these other stabilizing interactions that we that we just covered. Okay, so let me comment um, a little bit more detail on this this concept of agostic interactions because not only is this important when we we're thinking about uh, hydrometallation and, and beta hydride elimination, but it will become critical when we talk about CH activation later, uh, later this semester. So a agostic interaction refers to, I think I just got to the wrong page on my notes. Just one minute. This interesting uh, three center two electron interaction that was first appreciated uh, by uh, uh, Maurice Brookhart during, I believe, a sabbatical stint that he had at Oxford, where he was collaborating with Malcolm Green, who is a prominent organometallic, well, both of them are prominent organometallic chemists. Uh, Malcolm Green spent his entire career at Oxford. And they noticed in crystal structures like the one, um, like the complex shown here, this uh, titanium trichloro trichloride alkyl species, an unusual, let me make sure I get this right. An unusually short uh, bond distance. Oh, this isn't right. Sorry, this should just be H. And, and compressed bond angle of this alkyl this ethyl substituent that would not be expected unless there's an attractive interaction here between the sigma bonding orbital of the CH bond and the metal center. And so this process, if you look a little bit further down this column, was termed an agostic interaction. And this, I think the story goes that um, Malcolm Green and Maurice Brookhart were discussing this observation over, over dinner. And remember this is at, at Oxford. So you have uh, uh, these, these somewhat unusual dinners where you, you, you know, you're, you're, everyone's dressed up in, in capes like out of Harry Potter and they're sitting around a, a, a table, scholars from all different fields. And a, and a Greek scholar recommended this, this term, agostic from, from Greek, which means to hold close to oneself as in a, a shield. So, so um, that's the origin of this, of this now famous term in organometallic chemistry. 
So we can, I think it's instructive here to consider, let's first consider no agostic interaction and do some quick electron counting um, for this, this titanium species. Does anyone wanna, wanna jump in here? Shenghua, what do you think? Titanium 4D0, 12 electrons. Okay, and then now let's consider the agostic interaction as a as a L type ligand. Then what would you what would you get? Fourteen So the key point here is that when you have complexes like this that have unusually low electron overall electron count and they have alkyl substituents they can stabilize themselves by forming bonding interactions uh, of filled orbitals, sigma bonding orbitals on the ligands to, to the metal. Now, if you're given a, a problem on an exam and, and there's no explicit agostic interaction drawn, you, can, you shouldn't assume that it, it exists. So, so only, only consider this in your electron counting when you have reason to believe that, that you need to uh, uh, to take it uh, take it into account, and then one one point also of of nomenclature is that the agostic interaction is closely related to another type of complex that we covered called uh, si sigma complex. But agostic interaction should refer specifically to an intramolecular process. Remember this Greek definition: holding close to oneself. It refers to an alkyl ligand forming an intramolecular stabilizing interaction with the, the metal center. So that's the defining feature of a agostic interaction. And I think actually like the Wikipedia article on this is, is, is incorrect um, when, when it describes what the defining features of agostic interaction are. Um, but if you look at the IUPAC gold book, then if, if, if this is the kind of thing you're interested in, you, can, uh, you, don't, you don't have to take my word for it, I guess. Okay, let's consider now um, a example from the uh, modern literature, and this will bring us to our chemist of the day from uh, the day six worksheet. And I don't know if anyone recognizes her. Let me pull it up. Feel free to shout out if you recognize the chemistry or the, the chemist. This is Allison Fout, two L's. Maybe one of my TAs can help me check. It's totally wrong. She's a chemist at Texas A&M, previously of Illinois and has done some important work in, uh, in, in first row metal organometallic um, uh, chemistry and, and including catalysis and has, has done uh, some, some really nice work looking at these carbene ligated uh, uh, low valent iron species that we'll consider, we'll consider here in this example. One L. One L, oh shoot. Okay. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I was, uh, I, I drew one L initially. Her scientific background, well, this is loading. Her scientific background, she did her bachelor's at Yannon University, PhD at Indiana with Dan Mendiola before he moved to UPenn and then postdoc with Ted Bentley, one of, one of Ted's first, first postdocs at Harvard before starting her career at Illinois. So in a recent ChemCom paper from last year, she looked at this series of, of complexes and found evidence of uh, agostic interaction. And so I'll just pose this question to the class and anyone can um, shout if you, if you have an idea or raise your hand. So we, can, we, we talked about how X-ray can be a diagnostic feature for assigning an agostic interaction. What other techniques might be useful? Neutral and defection. Okay, neutron diffraction. Um, I 
And so Shenghua here is commenting on the fact that with X-ray, we don't see H atoms. So uh, because they, uh, we, we don't, we don't, we can't precisely position H atoms because they don't diffract electrons strongly. So we can infer where they are and we can infer, we can still make accurate measurements of some of the angles shown on this above diagram, um, but we can't precisely position the, the H atom. What about any other more common technique that doesn't require a, a synchrotron? Assuming those peaks would look different by NMR unless it's right ah. time scale outside of NMR. Beautiful. Okay. And that was a very precise answer. Alex, so let's consider proton NMR. Now, would we expect if there was an agostic interaction for that corresponding H resonance to be shifted upfield or downfield, or you have no expectation? Well, I would say it's going to go downfield. Downfield. Why do you think that? Less electron density in the sigma bond. I think it's a reasonable thing to think, but I, I will push back on that by, by asking for metal hydrides. Do they typically show up at uh, high field or, or, or upfield or downfield of, of uh, typical CH? Well, the, so they're typically in the negative region. And so it's true, I think this is a fair point. You might not expect a priori where to position uh, an H atom that's forming an agostic interaction, but it turns out to be upfield. So I think that they, they, they will often show up at negative, um, ne negative shifts. Uh, and in this paper, one of the nice parts that I won't get into in, in into the time, but you can take a look at this as part of the class reading is that they look at a whole series of this with different um, L ligands um, and actually can map how the NMR, freak, uh, NMR shifts of the agostic uh, uh, proton changes as a function of the, the, the coordinating ligand. Yeah. Would you expect the benzylic positions to be like equivalent or only one can participate in the bonding each time? Right, so this was a, a point that I think Alex was alluding to. At a priori, you don't know, you wouldn't know if you were if you just made this complex and you went down to the NMR room, if there's free rotation or if rotation about that carbon metal bond axis is fast on the NMR time scale, then you would then you would not see um, well you'd see averaging. Uh, in this case, that rotation is slow on the NMR time scale, so they actually see resolution of those two. Not, not just the two benzylic positions, but actually within that one benzylic position resolution between the, the different H atoms that are, that are inequivalent. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you'd expect a priori some temperature dependence on that. So for, when you heat up, then you would assume you'd see coalescence of some of these peaks that are inequivalent at lower temperature. Great question. All right, let's take a look now at some practical examples of migratory insertion and, and we'll consider processes that involve both um, carbometallation and hydrometallation and the microscopic reverses um, thereof. Okay, so first let's consider this example of this CP ligated zirconium methyl with a free coordination site. And we'll talk about how to open up those free coordination sites from more stable starting materials when we consider the next example. We're gonna expose this reactive complex now to an atmosphere of ethylene and get to the cationic species shown here. Okay, Cindy, what might you expect to happen next? So we'll, let, let's take a step back. The CP ligands, 
we've seen when we've encountered them before in class, we've seen that these are typically spectator links. So let's let's just assume these are oops, these are not going to be involved in the action. So these are going to be uh, bystanders and just watch the show. We have a metal a, a pi alkene interaction, and then we have an alkyl ligand. So based on what we've covered before, what might we expect to happen? Beautiful, methyl group will migrate. So I'll, we'll just push arrows here. You know, arrow pushing, some organometallic chemists don't like it because it's not actually what happens, but, but I think it's, it's useful. Here. So we know that metal alkyls are, are, are nucleophilic in character at the, at the uh, carbogenic substituent. So it, it will essentially push electrons, <coughs> form a new carbon carbon sigma bond, open a coordination site. Still cationic. And now we should have one, two, Three. So that methyl group here just migrated to the terminal position. Maybe I should draw this as CH3. Just two, one, two, three, four. Okay, that's not a good start. One, two, three. Okay, wonderful. And now what might happen next? Well, we've got nothing else in solution, but more ethylene. So what, what do you think, Cindy, would happen next? Rinse, wash, and repeat. Coordinate another molecule of ethylene. Ad infinitum, or not actually infinitum. And the product of this will be what? Polyethylene. And this is, in fact, how much of the world's polyethylene um, is still made, but as particularly pre 1990s, essentially all of the um, world's polyethylene was made by this process or a heterogeneous. Uh, a variant of this of this process, which is called, I don't know if anyone, does anyone know the name of this process? Ziegler not up polymerization. Carl Ziegler from the Max Planck Institute for Colon Fortran developed the polyethylene process and then Nada developed an analogous process for making polypropylene from propylene. And these are called metallocene based polymerization processes um, because they use metallocenes as the, as the precatalyst. I think this, I might have the order of magnitude off by, by one or two, but I, I think this process is used to make 100 million tons of polyethylene per, per year. So in terms of large scale, um, it's it's hard to uh, hard hard to beat uh, to beat beat this process, and then we can consider now a, um, a a similar but but somewhat different process. So note that the metallocene polymerization methods developed by Ziegler and Nada used these early transition metals. Uh, through the eighties and nineties, there was a significant interest in developing processes with late transition metals. And there were a number of reasons for that. One of which is because for late transition metals, it's um, you can tune the coordination environment around the metal with different families of ligands. And, and as a result, tune the properties of the resulting polymers in ways that are diff difficult to achieve with the metallocene type. So let's consider a classic example from the literature. The original reference is here, and this will be available in your reading if you'd like to. This is from the Brookart Laboratory, 
who developed the first example of late transition metal, efficient late transition metal catalysts for ethylene polymerization. So the precursor here is the dimethyl nickel species shown here, ligated with a one uh, with these, these bisimine ligands containing bulky aryl substituents. There's an initial activation step where the, uh, the precatalyst is treated with this unusual looking reagent. Juntao, what's going on here? A coordination to try to one of the vessel. Okay, so we, we have a strong acid. We're gonna protonate one of the methyls off, and we're, what's the byproduct of that going to be? Uh, methane. Methane. We'll then have the diethyl ether ligated complex, which actually turns out to be somewhat stable, isoluble. And Juntao, do you know the name of this unusual looking acid here? This is called Brookart's acid. And the structure here for BARF, maybe I should draw that just in case. I've seen this. BARF is the prototypical weakly coordinating anion that, that folks like to use in organometallic chemistry because it promotes interaction with the incoming reactive substituent, in this case, the ethylene. So it's a three, five bis CF3 aryl group, four of them around a negatively charged boron center. Let me see if I can move this out of the way. And the acid, the HX form of this weakly coordinating anion, as somebody shouted, I couldn't hear who is, is called Burkhardt's acid. Overall minus charge. Or if you want maybe a, to be a little more precise than if we, the formalism, the negative charge should be on more on there. Okay, so we've activated the catalyst now, here we are. And this is cationic. You, we see that it has only this weakly coordinating diethyl ether. So this is going to be hot to trot. It can find a molecule of ethylene or a few molecules of ethylene here and, and uh, form this propagating polymer chain, which I've highlighted here in orange. It turns out that through some detailed kinetic studies, they find that the resting state the, the catalyst is, is actually here. And from here, a series of interesting events can happen. So if we follow the blueprint that Cindy gave us, we can undergo uh, carbometallation or one, two migratory insertion and then repeat. But note that upon carbometallation, we have a recipe for beta hydride elimination. We've got an open coordination site. We've got an alkyl, ligand where at, the, uh, where at the beta position, there is a tempting looking H out. So indeed, from this intermediate now, we, um, either it can coordinate another molecule of ethylene or it can undergo beta hydride elimination to get a, a, an alkene terminated polymer chain bound to the catalyst with a hydride ligand. From here then, a few different things can happen. You can have a process of associative displacement where ethylene comes in, knocks off the polymer, and that can be it. That would, and, and then the metal hydride can initiate a new polymerization. That's a chain transfer event. Or the H atom can reinsert to the opposite position, opposite regiochemical disposition that it came. Uh, that it originally came from, 
to give now a branched species. And from this branch species, the same thing can happen again, and you can walk inward in, within the chain, or you can coordinate another molecule of, of ethylene. So now you have a mechanism by which promoting or suppressing beta hydride elimination, you can tune the extent of branching of the resulting polymer chain. And you can indeed tune how likely this beta hydride elimination is, is to happen by, by tuning the aryl groups on the, the ligand, by tuning the pressure of, C, uh, of, of ethylene and tuning the temperature of the, the overall um, reaction. Okay, any questions on those two polymerization processes? Okay, so, so this will, this portion will mostly just review things that we've, we've just covered. Um, beta hydride elimination now is the microscopic reverse of hydrometallation or one, two migratory insertion with the hydride ligand. The key point, as we just saw in this example, is the presence of an open coordination site that allows formation of the agostic intermediate through this three center two electron um, uh, species. And then um, intrinsically, this process is, is reversible. In the context of that, uh, Brookhart polymerization, we, we, we mentioned that if you want to suppress beta hydride elimination, then there are some strategies to, to do that. One is to add higher concentration of a, of a trapping ligand. We're adding a trapping ligand and then increasing the concentration until you see evidence that beta hydride elimination is suppressed. Mm -hmm. You can play tricks like increasing the steric bulk around the coordination sphere of, of the metal. Uh, as well to, to induce a confirmation, uh, a conformational bias uh, away from, from forming the sagostic interaction. In terms of um, reactivity trends now, this is essentially the opposite of the migratory aptitudes that we saw in the case of one, two migratory insertion. So uh, one point that is very relevant in polymerization is that beta hydride elimination is more facile than beta alkyl elimination. You can imagine the process that I just presented would be even more complex if in addition to competitive beta hydride elimination, you could split up the propagating polymer chain by beta carbon elimination, but that process is kinetically slow. In some special cases, or arguably these are not that special depending on your perspective, but you can have situations where there's a competition between a beta hydrogen atom and a beta hetero atom. And intuitively, you could probably talk yourself into thinking that one is favored or the other is favored. But in practice, a nice paper as, as revealed in a nice paper by Bill Morandi's group from, from last year, multiple factors contribute to whether the beta hydrogen elimination process is favored or the beta hetero heteroatom elimination process favor, including the electronics of the ligand, steric bulk of the ligand, and the nature of the, of the leaving group. So if you're interested in that, uh, that's something that you can read more about, but I, I won't say, I won't comment on it further uh, because it is somewhat of a specialized uh, case. Okay, let's consider one more case here in this beta, uh, this hydrometallation, beta hydride elimination theme. Uh, and that will, be the case of this uh, bis CP chlorozirconium hydride species. So, Elin, tell me a little bit about this. Do you know the name of this complex? Schwartz, Schwartz reagent. Very good. And how would you go about making this in the lab? Okay. Okay. Dichloride and a, a hydride, aggressive hydride source. I think you said LAH, is that right? The dichloride is a stable starting material. 
you're going to hit that with LAH. And then in practice, one of the issues is that you do indeed get the Schwartz's reagent, but with it, you get a mixture of the corresponding dihydride. Oh, oh I, I lost my starting material. Okay, sorry about that. Trying to get too clever with these, uh, my notability skills. Okay, so in practice, we get a mixture and then we can convert the dihydride to the chlorohydride just with treatment of, of DCM. Let me zoom in on this and make it a little bit less awkward looking. Okay. All right, Elin. So then reaction of Schwartz reagent with 2 butene will give what? Migratory insertion. Beautiful. And you said first, so I assume that means you think something else is going to happen. What, will, what else will happen? Okay. The bond can rotate. So we've come in that way. And so you're saying. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's my problem. Okay, so then you wanna, which bond do you wanna rotate? Beautiful. You rotate that bond. Now we have a methyl group disposed right next to our open coordination site with three juicy looking H atoms, one, two, three, four. And you're saying another beta hydride elimination. will get us to This. And lastly, what? Have another microinsertion to form the primary alcohol. Beautiful. One, two, three, four. In this process of transposition of a metal alkyl bond to a distinct position to where it was formed is called chain walking. Super, any questions on that? Can you help me? Okay, so I didn't draw the chloride atom, I don't want anyone to panic at where that went. Okay, let's now consider problem of the day number three from the day six worksheet. Let me pull that up. So this builds on several of the themes that we've just covered. So this is a two-parter. First, consider this reaction shown in A, 
where we're taking a terminal alkyne, subjecting it to HCl and iridium one precatalyst and getting something new. And then a different reaction that's related where we take that same alkyne, we react it now with the alkyl chloride shown and we get that same product D, but with a new product or byproduct E. So provide the structures of D and E. And then take a look at this screening data or optimization data shown in the table, the bottom right. And try to come up with an explanation for why in this bottom case, the reaction seems to benefit from higher temperature and from the presence of CFOS ligand and the structure of CFOS is shown, shown there. So let's take a couple minutes to think about that on your own, discuss with your neighbor, and then we'll discuss as a class.
All right, Christine, what do we think for the structure of A? Not sure, but maybe you had to hazard a guess. Which guess would you hazard? What are you deciding between or pondering? Go with your instinct, Christine. Ah, alkene, alkene or alkene or something. Ah, beautiful, okay. And then now we have two options. Chloride gonna be here or here, or three options, but two positional options and then one stereochemical option. So what, what do you prefer here? This I don't think is necessarily obvious a priori. So you can just say whatever you prefer. Be the terminal. Terminal, okay. It's the, it's the internal, but as I said, I don't think it's intrinsically obvious a priori, so that's fine. Great, super. And then we're halfway there for the next one too. And then we know we're forming the same product from the bottom reaction. And the reaction is, is balanced in terms of stoichiometry. Then what is the byproduct going to be here, Christine? Chloride's going to be gone, right, yeah. from, the, from the second. Yeah, so maybe the amino. Beautiful. Super. Thank you, Christine. Good job. OK, how about Jaylun? What about the, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you think in terms of mechanism and then the role of this ligand and elevated temperature. For the second question, I actually have one additional question sure. for the paper. I don't know how they prove that uh, the alcohol or acrylate uh, is actually functioning. It may just be higher temperature uh, means uh, the uh, elimination of the uh, chloride uh, ketone uh, reagent to do the elimination first and yeah. you return to the first reaction. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to, uh, how do they like uh, this proof it? Yeah, I think that's a reasonable concern. I think one of the experiments that they did, if I remember correctly, is that you can, if, if you're concerned about that, you could just remove the iridium because if it's a, if it's a base or proton mediated elimination process, then, then you can remove iridium catalyst, heat it up and see if you generate the enone and HCl in the absence of the catalyst, see if that accumulates, right? This EPL kind of HCl, you're not gonna get reactivity with that. You can actually at, at high temperature, but not yeah. not at lower temperature. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's not very well, for this uh, case. I say uh, if if the iridium is uh, necessary for the process, uh, then the, uh, the the ligand is forcing the uh, so the iridium is uh, doing the 
oxidative addition to the carbon chloride bond in the beta hydride elimination is uh, accelerated by the ligand. Okay, great. So let's first just consider the mechanism of the top reaction. So here, I think this should be pretty straightforward. I'm just going to abbreviate the catalyst here. We know this is the dimeric precatalyst. Um, let's say it dissociates and then undergoes oxidative addition to HCl. And now you have a, in some order, high, CH bond formation, C chloride bond formation. Um, let's say it's a hydro metallation followed by CCl reductive elimination. You, can, you could also consider the opposite and you wouldn't intrinsically be wrong. So that's the mechanism for the top one. And Jaylun was helping us with the mechanism for the bottom one. You're saying that you oxidatively add to the carbon chlorine bond. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So let's consider that iridium. Now we're iridium three. Have this right ligand. And then I think you said beta hydride elimination next. Yes. Even though you weren't happy about it. Yes. Which is fine. You don't always have to be happy with every mechanism proposed. Just please don't review my papers. <laughs> And then now, look, look what we just did. We've, we've essentially intercepted the same intermediate from above. Let, let me actually, here, let me, let me draw out this in just a little bit more detail in case anyone wants to see this. going to draw it in, in this order of CCL bond formation first. And then you said the role of the ligand is, could you just repeat what you, what you said, Jalen? Accelerate this beta hydride elimination. Would you expect a ligand to accelerate beta hydride elimination? Uh, I mean, if if they want to use this region to avoid this strong acid, then uh, you should have something to accelerate that that process, and that's what you want. So that's what your ligand is, I guess, supposed to do. Okay. What if I told you that beta hydride elimination is fast? And we don't need to worry about that step. Then what else could the ligand do? The uh, oxidative addition. Ah. So we said that more electron rich metal center will undergo oxidative addition faster. This is a C alkyl halide oxidative addition. So we might anticipate a priori, it could be a little more challenging. It's a sec, uh, it's primary, but uh, position, but not a methyl position. And likewise, higher temperature here might um, also be expected to accelerate the oxidative addition step. I think Jaylun pointed out an important mechanistic caveat that we need to consider, which is as you elevate temperature, this alkyl chloride could naturally eliminate HCl. Um, and so that's something that you, uh, you need the appropriate controls in place to be able to rule out. Does anybody have a different explanation? If you were thinking along related but different lines that the role of the ligand here might be to instead accelerate CH insertion, 
So oxidative addition to the CH bond followed by beta chloride elimination, that is also a viable pathway. Um, and actually from the experiments in the paper, I don't think they can confidently disambiguate between those two pathways. Okay, great. Any questions on that? Okay, let's zoom through transmetallation. We covered transmetallation a little bit in the main group organometallic lecture. So I won't rehash all of those points. What I'll try to focus on are some of the details of transmetallation as they pertain to cross-coupling, which will be a subsequent lecture. So those details are, um, are, are uh, we, we'll see in the cases of organotin reagents and organoboron um, reagents, which we didn't cover in, in much depth in the main group organometallic class. Okay, so as a refresher from, from last time, um, there are several different flavors of transmetallation uh, and that, that can be relevant to cross-coupling type reactions. So we discussed this, uh, this top flavor where you have two organometallics that essentially swap, swap partners in, a, in a, a metathesis type process. You can have a, in the, the middle line, we have what's called a redox transmetallation where you have a metallic form of M2 that's undergoing simultaneous ligand swapping uh, and redox. And then the third flavor, which is most relevant to cross-coupling, where you have some M2X, where X is something like a halide or a hydroxide ligand, and uh, you're swapping that out for a new uh, carbogenic substituent with concomitant formation of M1X. And so just like we saw before, the thermodynamics for this process become favorable if M2 is more electronegative or equivalently if M1 is more electron positive. So remember the thermodynamic driving force here is that you want to form a pair with electronegative and electropositive. So if we consider, for example, um, M M1 is boron, then the thermodynamic driving force is forming a, a boron halide interaction or a boron hydroxide uh, uh, species. Overall, transmetallation, despite being simple to draw out on paper and these representations is in fact mechanistically quite complex. And you will see detailed mechanistic studies you know, almost every month on different aspects of transmetallation um, in the in the literature. So I'll try to summarize some of the key themes, but please appreciate that this is not totally exhaustive here. I think one of the emerging and exciting topics in the, the literature as it relates to transmetallation is in the stereochemistry of, of alkyl metal species uh, as they undergo trans, transmetallation. And this is something I think that when I took organometallics, a graduate course now, I'm dating myself, but some number of years ago, um, this was not, not something that was really on people's radar, but in the intervening years, there's been a lot of technology developed to, to prepare an antiomerically defined or optically enriched alkyl boron, alkyl tin reagents. And thus we're positioned to um, study the, 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 the stereochemical outcomes of, of, of how those species engage in transmetallation. There are also an increasing number of catalyst ligand combinations that can actually engage these alkyl metal reaction partners. Um, so this becomes an important problem to, to understand both preparatively and conceptually. So uh, the case is pretty simple when we have CSP2 coupling partners. So things like alkenol, we know that if we go in with a Z alkenol zinc reagent, uh, that, that transmetallation is typically stereo retentive and we will come out with a, the same stereochemical geometry, um, alkenol palladium species, and that will get relayed into the ultimate uh, product, ultimately into the product. In the case of alkyl coupling partners, there are two pathways that can be operative and those are exemplified here. There's an open form and a closed form. And the open form is stereo inverted at the carbogenic substituent. And the closed form is stereo 
retentive. And here are some leading references if you'd like to read more on this. I think the um, stereo, the, the closed form is to me somewhat intuitive from what we've covered so far. The open form, I honestly always struggle to understand what orbitals are involved in this uh, process. And I've, uh, and, and, um, I've, I've talked to people who, who are some of the thought leaders in this area and, and still am confused about this. But in any case, I think if, if it's helpful to you, you can think of this as being somewhat analogous to an SN2 type process or somewhat analogous to that SN2 type oxidative addition process that we talked about. And if that is not helpful to you, then, then you, you can ignore, ignore that. Let's consider one example from the recent literature where we see uh, this open type transmetallation um, uh, manifest itself. And I, I don't have the reference jotted down here, but I will, I will uh, share the original reference in the, in the readings. So does anyone wanna take a stab at what the product of this transformation would be? So we're coming in copper one, phosphine, uh, phosphoramidite ligand, one, one bisboron as the nucleophilic component and then an Allyl bromide is the electrophilic component. Any takers? Philip, what do you think? Is that benzyl or butyl? That is uh, benzyl. So what product would you draw if I just told you this is a more or less cross, a, a, a classical cross coupling in disguise? You, you would think of something like a Suzuki. Okay, and then and then what? Beautiful, beautiful. No need to overthink it. We're just doing a copper Suzuki here. And the only twist is that this we have this one one this this moron that looks a little bit intimidating, but in point of fact is going to react just like a normal alkyl boron. And the product will end up being a homo al boron. But the very intriguing thing about this report is that because you have a chiral ligand on, on the metal and the two carbon boron bonds are prochiral, now the transmetallation step actually in the transmetallation step, the catalyst is differentiating between two chiral carbon boron bonds and forming a, a stereocyst. So it's an example where stereochemistry is established in the transmetallation step. Um, and through some computational work, so the experimental work was done by the Cho group at POSTEC, and then the computational work was done by Mookie Bikes group. Uh, they pinned down this open transition state and established through some quite um, rigorous mechanistic studies that the, the transmetallation is stereo inverted at the uh, carbon boron bond during transmetallation. Any questions on that? Products should be Bnet, thank you. Okay, in terms of relative rates here for organo tin, um, the the aptitude here follows, I think, my first approximation, some of the same trends we saw in oxidative addition. So, groups that have higher S character transfer faster. Alkynal tra transfers faster than alkenal. Um, 
more electron rich and less sterically hindered alkenol transfers faster than less electron rich and more hindered alkenol. And then aryl and, and alkyl are the least favorably transferred from organotin. And this tracks with our experience. If you've ever done a stilly coupling, you'll typically use something like an aryl tributyl tin nucleophile and the alkyl groups are transferred much more slowly than the aryl group. And that's why those, cross, those reagents react in a chemoselective fashion. With the CSP2 and CSP coupling partners, a, a appropriate, a, a important factor that allows them to react at a faster rate is pre-association. Um, so the filled pi bonding orbital, uh, by virtue of being a, 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 a source of high electron density, can form a coordinating interaction with the metal that then can facilitate transmilation, and that is absent in the alkyl coupling. Okay, let's consider now the or organoboron coupling partners in transmetallation. And even though Suzuki couplings with organoboron re re reagents have been run, it's probably not an exaggeration, tens of millions of times on, on planet Earth and have the, the overall transformation has been known for 50 years. The mechanism of this transmetallation, the, the, the key constituent transmetallation step was largely uncharacterized uh, as recently as, as uh, what, what is it now, six or seven years ago. There had been proposals in the literature, um, uh, but, but the rigorous pinning down of the mechanism and characterization of the key pre-transmetallation intermediates uh, was was largely absent from the literature. Um, and there was a really important contribution from the group of Scott Denmark in 2016, a uh, highlight here that, uh, uh, that actually for the first time rigorously characterized um, the, these intermediates. And the key intermediate in, in question is, is, the, is the one shown here, the so-called PDOD intermediate that is formed prior to the incoming aryl group being transferred to the metal center. And the Denmark group was able to prepare this intermediate through two independent routes. The first starting from a trans oxidative addition complex and then reacting with the eight form of an organoboron species. So the eight form by virtue of being anionic um, and um, having, having more partial negative charge on the, 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 the aryl groups um, are, are um, undergo rapid uh, 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 transmetallation. And so uh, this was the coupling partner of choice. Here we lose Ki as thermodynamic driving force and then can form this interaction. Alternatively, they can start from the palladium hydroxide species, which you can imagine forming from the oxidative addition complex and then doing a halide extraction and then react that with the, the boron, uh, uh, boronic acid now in its, its non-8 form, its parent, parent form. In either case, they can get to this key PDOB intermediate. And through mechanistic studies, they find that Prior to transfer of this aryl prime group, there's a dissociation step that takes place of this ligand to open a coordination site that you need for that carbon boron bond to wrap around and, and transfer. From here, now we're off, off to the races um, in, in a classical CC. And they were able to, as I said, isolate three intermediates of this general flavor, all containing this key PDOB bond, one of which is shown, shown here. Uh, and the, the, the difference um, among them is, is, or the differences among them have to do with the, the nuclearity and, and speciation. But interest in this topic has continued. And so just Two years ago now, there was a, a really interesting report from our chemist of the day for day seven, 
I'll let him This is Alex December from Tasmania. You, you might not think so a priori, but it turns out Tasmania, University of Tasmania actually has a very rich history in organometallic chemistry, particularly organopalladium chemistry. That's where um, uh, Canty uh, spent most of his research career. Uh, and so in terms of Alex's background, he was uh, completed his PhD with Martin Banwell at the Australian National University and then was a postdoc with, with Greg Fu, where you can appreciate this, uh, his, his interest in this transmetallation problem was, was sparked. So he's been at Tasmania now since 2012. And what the December group was able to synthesize and characterize are these pre-transmetallation model complexes, where in essence, they tether, they play a trick and tether the arrow group to the supporting ligand. There we get to. Okay, they tether the supporting ligand to the aryl group that would normally be transferred. So they deliberately suppress the rate of aryl transfer through chelation with the goal of obtaining a species that will end up being amenable to character characterization by X-ray crystallography. So you can see here the key palladium O boron interaction. But now because of this, the, the ligand being tethered to the aryl group, um, you, you're not able to transfer the aryl group. It gets stuck there, but it can be characterized crystallographically. Uh, and then very recently, I think just a couple of weeks ago, they were able to extend the same concept to, to um, characterize pre-transition, pre-transition, uh, pre-transmetallation organonickel uh, uh, complexes as well. Okay, so with the remaining time that I have, let's give a let's get as far as we can in our carbene notes. Were there any questions uh, before jumping into this on the elementary steps lectures? notes. Okay, so we'll now shift gears slightly and we'll build this understanding of carbon metal multiply bonded species that we've encountered several times already. And to kick off this discussion, we'll first step back and think about what we know already about carbines. And then we'll layer on carbines as they relate to interactions with metals. The first thing that you'll appreciate is that carbenes are slightly different than the other ligands that we've covered, because with rare exceptions, they're not themselves stable in the absence of metal coordination. There are some exceptions, but in general, they are not stable. And so that tells you, so, so when we're thinking about our electron inventory, our electron counting, and we're talking about getting back to closed shell species, you can already get a flavor that that is going to break down a little bit when we're talking about carbenes. So, what do we know about carbenes? We know that they are three um, uh, that they're <clears throat> a divalent form of of carbon. So we have three 
SP2 hybridized um, uh, uh, bonding, or we have, we have, we have um, SP2 hybridization around carbon, two bonding interactions and one non-bonding interaction. And then we have an open uh, P orbital. The carbene can exist in two flavors, either a singlet where the uh, non-bonding sp2 orbital is doubly occupied, or a triplet where the non-bonding sp2 orbital is singly occupied and the p orbital uh, orthogonal to it is singly occupied. And this is a relatively new field compared to other things we've covered, a, a, a subfield of study within organometallic chemistry because it really only came online in the, in the 60s and, and 70s. So there are two um, general flavors of, of carbenes that are, let me make sure I have the right, pulled up the wrong, uh, wrong note set. But it's sim similar, okay. Wrong file. So there are two general flavors or two um, extremes along a continuum of metal carbene structure and, and bonding. And those are called Fischer type and Schrock type. And hopefully I'll try to, to help you appreciate too that this is indeed a, a spectrum or a continuum and that there are interesting and important case studies that are intermediate between Fischer and Schrock. So Fischer and Schrock are differentiated in almost all possible ways, really. The first is the overall polarity and polarization of the metal carbon bond. So in the Fischer type, the uh, carbon atom is electrophilic and the metal is nucleophilic. And the opposite is true in the uh, Schrock, Schrock type. So the polarization across that bond is, is different. The flanking substituents here are also different. So in the Fischer case, we will often, a, a signaling element that you're in the Fischer regime is that you will have a hetero atom attached to the, to the, to the carbene carbon. And that can be oxygen, nitrogen, or sulfur. Other signaling elements that you're in the Fischer regime are that the metal is low valent and low oxidation state. So think here, like something that's, uh, that's at the zero oxidation state. And that you're at the, that the metal is a late transition metal or, or to middle transition metal. In the Schrock case, the substituents on the carbon are typically alkyl or H, and they're often referred to as alkylidines. The metal is in a high oxidation state, high valent, and these are typically early transition metals and can get into the, into the middle of the, of the transition metal series. And we'll, as we'll learn, we, we, we end up doing electron counting uh, different for these two species. That's one of the key, the key points, the key <laughs> takeaways here. Bless you. In terms of reactivity, a first pass approximation, you can think of the Fischer type as being carbonyl-like and the Schrock type as being um, illid-like. Or even, or even Grignard, Grignard-like. And there are several other types of carbene species that, that are also important. That includes carbenoid, vinylidine, and, and heterocyclic carbene. Now, one thing to remember about all of these is that when it comes to electron counting, that we just we see them and, and we immediately just think, okay, we're just gonna treat these like. Fisher carbons. Let me unpack each of these in two minutes and then, and then you'll be free to go. So carbenoid, the, the noid part of it 
is supposed to denote that the reactivity of these species resembles that of the free carbene. So what do we know that free carbenes do? How do they react with organic molecules? They do things like CH extraction, they do things like cyclopropanation. So carbenoids exhibit largely that same reactivity. They're typically unstable. There are some rare examples where people have isolated and characterized these, but in general, they're unstable. They react like free carbenes. And bond formation, for example, in CH functionalization or cyclopropanation is, is outer sphere. So it's not happening. Um, uh, on the metal center. Some, some, some common catalysts for carbonoid transfer are things like dirhodium paddle wheels, as well as nitrogen ligated ruthenium, rhodium, uh, or, or copper species. Another class here is our, our and, and so a signaling element that you might be dealing with a carbonoid is when you see a diazo. Vinylidines um, are these interesting allene looking like um, metal carbon doubly bonded species. They're formed by a spontaneous rearrangement that takes place from terminal acetylides in reacting, interacting with low valent metals. And these are Fischer type by virtue of the fact that the vinylidine not coordinated to the metal is strongly favorable to be in the singlet carbene state. And then the last flavor are these N-heterocyclic carbenes, which are also called Arduango or Wanslick carbenes. Where these are, I think, in the Crabtree textbook described as Fischer carbenes on steroids because they have not just one, but two heteroatoms attached to the carbene carbon atom. So I want to expose you to these different types of carbenes in terms of electron counting. Remember that all of these are, are Fischer type. Okay, so we'll pick up here next time. Um, and. Uh, I want to be respectful of the fact you have to, many of you have to jump into a lecture, so we'll wrap it up. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or let the TAs know how, how we can help you. Thanks.